I want to welcome everyone, especially our visitors. Uh, if everyone would take a moment at some time during the service and fill out an attendance card. Uh, I'm from the back of the pew in front of you and pass the dials so those will get picked up towards the end of the service. Our first song this evening will be number 438. 438. Our next song will be number 492, 492, and after uh, this song will be led in our opening prayer. pray together. Father, we are thankful so much for this hour that we can join together to once again be blessed with the Christian friends that 
we have come to know and love so much. We're thankful for every single person who is here on this hour. And Father, we pray for uh, those uh, among our number that we know would like to be here, but their health is not uh, well enough to allow that. And we pray for their improved health. We give you thanks, Father, for taking care of our every need that we have and every aspect for creating such a, a fantastic earth, for creating bodies that continue to function on a daily basis. You, you were the creator of everything that we see and we acknowledge the wonderful design and we thank you for that. We're also thankful, Father, that we live in this uh, country, the United States, where we can uh, gather and, and worship freely tonight. And we pray that as the uh, time passes that there will be opportunities around the entire world for people to enjoy what we are enjoying now. We're thankful that we all can carry a, a Bible that teaches us what you would like for us to do, how we should live our lives. We pray, Father, as we enter our uh, lesson tonight that we can gain from it and apply it in, in our lives and be better Christians because of it. We're thankful for the example that Jesus left here, his ability to live amongst us, to live the perfect life and follow your will. We, we, we recognize that he did nothing wrong, he did not sin, yet he, his death allows us to have an opportunity to live eternally with you. We're thankful for his resurrection, for his sacrifice. We, we give you all the, all the praise that we can for coming up with that plan. We know there's no other way that that could have, could have happened. We're thankful so much for Jesus. We pray, Father, that as we uh, leave this place, that people will, will recognize that there's something that is different about us, that we will, through our actions, through our language, through our ability to teach, we can share the good news with them that other people might be able to come to know you and what your will is. We, we recognize, Father, that so much that we enjoy living here, but we also acknowledge that this is a temporary home and that we would pray that we would uh, be able to make good choices and uh, that we recognize that our ultimate goal is to live eternally with you in heaven. And we pray that you would help us to achieve that, to overcome the temptations that we have while we're on this earth, to be able to ward off Satan and uh, the attacks that he uh, lays in store for us each, each of our uh, each day, we, we recognize that he is powerful and he's trying to find us in our weakest moments. And we pray, Father, that you give us strength to overcome that so that we can take advantage of the sacrifice that Jesus has given for each one of us. We thank you, Lord, for, for all the blessings that we receive, we receive. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next song is going to be number nine, song number nine.
Next song is uh, 732. Number 732. anyone using the book, uh, if you'd like to mark the invitation song, that will be number 67. Number 67. We'll now have our scripture reading and the lesson of the evening. Before the lesson tonight, let's read Hebrews chapter 8, and we'll be reading verses 8 through 12. Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none of his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Covenants dot the biblical landscape. You find them especially in the Old Testament on what seems at times 
like almost every page, at least in the early chapters and books of the Old Testament. Sometimes covenants are made between two people. At other times, we find covenants being made between individuals and God. For example, there was the covenant that was made between God and Noah, Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. There is the covenant that God made with Abraham, Genesis chapter 15. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 2. God made a covenant with David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. And so we get a smattering of instances where we find God making a covenant, entering into an agreement with someone else. Well, that is our significant word that we're going to study tonight. If you're visiting with us tonight, first of all, thank you for coming our way and being a part of our worship assembly this afternoon. We are, and in the second place, for the sake of those of you that may be visiting tonight, we are going through a series of lessons this year in which we are highlighting different Bible words. And the word that we want to highlight in this lesson is the word covenant. And we're going to do that from the text that was read just a moment ago. And so when we find covenants all over the Bible, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're being, I don't want to say set up because that, that sounds kind of negative, but it's as if God is preparing us for something bigger. And I believe he was. In the days of Jeremiah, God made what may well have seemed like a startling statement to his people. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, is where God said to his people through the prophet Jeremiah, the days are coming in which I will make a new covenant with my people. In other words, the text that was read from Hebrews chapter 8 is a quotation of Jeremiah chapter 31. So that's where those words first appeared. It's where they were first spoken to God's people. When God told them, the Jewish people, that one day he was going to replace that Sinai covenant, the covenant that God made with his people at Mount Sinai when he gave them their law and, uh, and entered into this relationship with them, he was going to change that. He was going to replace that covenant with something new. I suspect that was a startling statement to the people. And in our text, the writer of Hebrews quotes that passage from Jeremiah 31 to bolster his claim that he had just made that the New Testament is a better covenant that was established upon better promises. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 6. What I want for us to do tonight for just a few minutes is answer this question. What makes the new covenant better than the old covenant? In what ways is the new covenant not like the covenant that God made with the Jews at Sinai? Right? That's what the writer of Hebrews says in quoting Jeremiah. In verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 8, he says in quoting Jeremiah that this covenant, this new covenant, will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. What makes it so? What makes the new covenant different and better than the old? Well, we could go to a lot of different passages that, that, would, that would bring some light to that question and offer some, some answers, some perspective on that. I want us to stay right here in Hebrews chapter 8, right here in this particular text, and highlight what this writer highlighted from Jeremiah that constituted the differences, the betterness, if you will, of the new covenant. And I've divided those into three. Three things that make the new covenant better than the old. The first one is this, internalized law. Internalized law. Look at chapter 8. 
Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Right after he said, it's not going to be like the old covenant. Then he begins to explain what he means by that in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. So that's the first thing that Jeremiah said, quoted by the Hebrews writer, that he said regarding the difference. How is this law, new one, going to be different from the old one? Well, he says in the first place, this is how that new covenant will go. I'll write my laws on their minds and in their hearts. Internalized law. Well, what did he mean by that? Did he mean by that that it wasn't possible at all living under the old covenant for a person to internalize God's law? I don't believe that that is uh, the right conclusion. It was possible to internalize the law under the law of Moses. Your word have I hidden where? Psalm 119.11. In my heart that I might not sin against you. Doesn't that sound like internalized law, Psalm 119, verse 11, talking about the old law? God instructed his people in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, this law shall be on your heart. All right, so if that was the case, then, then in what sense does the writer mean that internalizing the law would be different under the new covenant than it was in the old? I'm going to offer you a possibility on that for your consideration and further study. I would argue that it is possible to internalize the new covenant to a deeper and greater degree than was required and necessary under the old law. Now I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment, but I want you to consider the language as being similar to what John wrote in John 1.17. So this is kind of a side point, but it, it underscores the main point that I'm trying to make. In John 1.17, John said, The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Right? Did John mean by that that there was no grace nor any truth under the old law? When he said, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Was there no grace and no truth under the old law? Did that only come when Jesus came? Well, certainly not. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Genesis 6, verse 8. And, and truth, the sum of God's word is truth. Psalm 119, verse 160. References to the old law. Yes, there was grace and there was truth under the old law. But grace and truth came to be expressed to a greater degree and in a, uh, a more powerful way when Jesus brought grace and truth with him. Those blessings find their fullest and most complete expression in Jesus Christ. I think that may be a similar thing here with the law. Yes, to a degree you could internalize the old law, but it is more of an internal thing under the new covenant than it was under the old covenant. It's a matter of degree as I see it. And I believe that's the case and that's the similarity uh, between John 1.17 and this passage. But what makes the New Testament more of an internalized law than the old? Let me offer you these suggestions. First of all, the nature of the new covenant is more... And listen closely, is more principle and less minutia. And that characteristic makes it not only more possible, but more imperative to internalize the new covenant law. The law of Moses tended to emphasize externals more than internals. And in that way, the law of Moses was what Paul would refer to it as, as an immature system. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and following, Paul likens life under the old law to life as an, a, a young child 
and life under the new covenant as life under a more mature system. When you think about an immature um, person, think of a child. Children need more explicit directions, don't they? As opposed to general principle. When you've got younger children, for example, if, if you're getting ready for bedtime at night, you may have to go through a number of very specific and explicit instructions, right? Brush your teeth. Rinse the toothbrush out when you're finished before you put it back up. Um, cl clean up your toys and put them in the toy box. Close the lid on the toy box, okay? Um, <clears throat> Take off the clothes you're currently wearing, put them in the dirty clothes hamper, okay? Then get your pajamas and put those on, right? And then pull back the covers on your bed and get into the bed and pull the covers back up over you and go to sleep, okay? Sometimes it needs to be that specific, doesn't it? Am I right? Okay. Okay. But as children get older, maturity brings the ability to apply principles. There comes a time when the child understands that if you simply say, it's time for bed, go to bed, that that simple instruction includes all of those other things that they used to have to get specific instructions about. That get ready for bed means I got to do the toothbrush thing, okay? And I've got to and I got to clean up the the toys in the room. That's all a part of the general principle of get ready for bed. That comes with maturity. It starts with the explicits, and you almost have to lay everything out. But maturity brings the ability to apply principles. I believe you see that in the difference between the old covenant and the new. Paul, again, described the Old Covenant as an immature system, Galatians 4. And under that system, there were a lot of specifics. Jewish rabbis had a collection that they, they had gone through the, the law, and they had, they had laid it down that the law contained 613 specific commands. In addition to that, the rabbis had added 15 volumes of commentary on those 613 commands. And it all had to do with the specifics. Think about some of the specific things that the law of Moses regulated. It had all of those dietary restrictions. Okay? If there was an animal that had a cloven hoof and chewed the cud, then you had instructions, could you eat that or not? And then if it had the cloven hoof but didn't chew the cud, you had a different law that pertained to that. And, and, and uh, scaly fish versus fish with no scales. And you had, you had all of this minutia just within the dietary laws. You had all of the, the laws regarding uh, the priestly garments, what they specifically had to wear, how long they were supposed to be. All of those minutia. If you were going to build, uh, if you were going to dig a pit on your property, the law of Moses had specific instructions on what you were to do to protect people from falling into that pit. As far as putting up some kind of a barrier, how high it had to be, and all of that. Um, if you had an ox, and your ox gored, a person, the law of Moses specifically had instructions on here's what you do if that ever happens. That's how explicit the law was on a lot of those things. The New Testament, by and large, is not constructed that way. Now, hear me well. Are there some specifics in the New Covenant? Absolutely. 
But it doesn't take the wisdom of Solomon in comparing how the old law lays itself out and how the new covenant lays itself out. They're not really laid out in exactly the same way. The New Testament, though it has its specifics, primarily deals in principles. For example, instead of specific instructions on every hypothetical circumstance that a person may encounter with another person. Jesus simply gives the broad principle, treat other people the way you want to be treated, Matthew 7, 12. So if I have an ox that gores somebody, you think Matthew 7, 12 just kind of covers that? It does, doesn't it? You don't have to get into the specifics of that kind of thing. Just treat other people the way you want to be treated. Instead of every social scenario spelled out, Paul would instruct in Romans 12, 17, respect what's right in the presence of all men. A general principle that would find specific applications in the various particulars of life that we encounter. Instead of every infinitesimal action being addressed, Paul would say, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22, look, abstain from every form of evil. In whatever form evil comes in, just leave it alone. General principle that God expects us to take and apply to our particular circumstances. Now, here's how that fits Hebrews 8.10. If you're going to incorporate those principles into your character, you are going to have to internalize those principles. You're going to have to have those principles written in your mind and in your heart so that when you encounter some situation, you have within you as a part of your character those eternal principles that will guide your conduct. You don't have to go and start flipping through 15 volumes of commentary on 613 specific commands to figure out, all right, my dog bit my neighbor. What am I supposed to do? Where do I find that specific law where God addresses dog bites? No, you have a principle that you've internalized that says treat others the way you want to be treated. Hold things honorable in the sight of all men. And that internalized principle then guides your conduct on how you respond to that scenario. That's a major difference between old covenant and new. My laws I'll write on their hearts and in their minds. Second thing. Second difference. Personal relationship. Back to Hebrews 8, look at verse 11. Again, he's listing the differences. This new covenant, not going to be like the one that I made with them when they came out of Egypt. For under this covenant, I'll write my law in their minds and on their hearts. And, verse 11, they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me. From the least of them to the greatest. Personal relationship. What is that? Doesn't that sound kind of counterproductive? I mean, or, or sound ca- counter to, uh, to what we would think? In other words, is, is he saying that under the new covenant, everybody in the world is going to know God? And so there's no need for us to be evangelistic and teach people to know God? Because everybody's, is that what he's saying? It's not what he's saying. Think about it again. We're talking about those who are a part of the family. Those who are a part of that relationship with God. And this relationship is going to be personal under the new covenant in a way that it wasn't under the old. Under the law of Moses, a person was physically born into the family and then taught to know the Lord later. Isn't that right? You were born physically into the lineage of Abraham, God's chosen people. And the sign of the covenant for the males was circumcision performed on the eighth day. So the covenant, you were a part of the covenant family simply by physical birth. 
You had no idea at that point who God was. But you were in the family. And so you would have to be told later about God. As you grew up and, and began to, to be able to communicate and learn and all of that, then you were taught about God. And so you were taught to know the Lord long after you were already a part of the family and under that covenant. What the writer is saying here is, under the new covenant, that's not going to be the process. You are not going to have to go to family members, brothers, and teach that brother to know the Lord. Why? Because if you are in the family under the new covenant, you already know the Lord. Because you had to get to know him to some degree to even get into the family. You weren't physically born into this family like you were under the old covenant. And then learn about the Lord later. That's why he says, you're not going to teach everyone his fellow citizen, those in the kingdom. You're not going to have to teach your brother, those in the family, to know the Lord. Because in order to become a citizen in the kingdom, and in order to become a brother in the family, you had to come to know Jesus and come to know God to even get into the family to begin with. Does that make sense? So a personal relationship would be necessary to even become a part of the family, and that did not have to be the case under the old law. You were just a part of the family if you were physically born into it through no choice of your own. That wouldn't be the case under the new covenant. So a person could be a part of the family, a citizen of the kingdom under the old law, and not know God. But in order to be a part of the new covenant family, you have to know God. A personal relationship. Just by the nature of the New Testament, anyone who is in the family is there because they've already internalized some very important truths just to be added to the family. To become a citizen and a brother or sister. The one who is in the family had to know the Lord on some level in order to get into it. Number three. Difference. Verse 12. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Characteristic number three, difference between the old law and the new, complete forgiveness. Complete forgiveness. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. See, under the old covenant, the repetition of those animal sacrifices should have reminded the people that those sacrifices were insufficient and destined to be replaced. That's the message they should have gotten from all of those repetitive animal sacrifices. The writer of Hebrews will make that point in chapter 10, Look at beginning in verse 1. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of those things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Okay, He comes right out and says it. Those sacrifices, continually made over and over again, could never make the worshiper perfect or complete. Otherwise, verse 2, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have a consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, Old Testament animal sacrifices, in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Just the simple repetitive nature of those sacrifices should have told the people there's something inadequate about those. Because if that sacrifice of that animal was sufficient to completely take away the problem of sin, then why are we, why are we continuing to offer them? Why do we have to offer another one the next day and then another one the next year? Why do we have to keep doing this over and over again if these sacrifices are really doing the job? But the sacrifice of the perfect Son of God needs no repetition. 
it's complete and perfect in itself. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, very quickly consider these passages. Chapter 7, verse 27. Speaking of Jesus, he does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Chapter 10, verse 10. By this will, the will of Christ, the new covenant, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Verse 12, same chapter. He, having offered once one sacrifice for sins, for all time set down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by one offering he's perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Verse 18, now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Animal sacrifices, repetitive. Why? Because they were insufficient. Sacrifice of Jesus, once for all time. Why? Because it was sufficient. So major difference between the covenants, old covenant, imperfect sacrifices. New covenant, perfect sacrifice, complete forgiveness. Paul put it this way, Acts 13, 38 and 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed, released from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Complete forgiveness. Through Christ, you can be released from, forgiven of, all of those things that the law of Moses could not forgive you of. covenant God promised in the days of Jeremiah the days are coming when I'm going to make a new covenant with you it's not going to be like the one that I made with your fathers when I brought them out of Egypt what's going to be different about it internalized law I'll write my law in their minds and on their hearts personal relationship you won't come into the family and then learn about God later You'll learn about God first so that everybody who's in the family will know God. Complete forgiveness. Not repetitive animal sacrifices that don't do the job. But the one offering for all time of the perfect Son of God that takes care of the sin problem all by itself. One of the key words in the book of Hebrews is the word better. Found 13 times in 13 chapters. And one of those times is Hebrews 8, verse 6, where the writer refers to the New Testament as being better than the old. It is a better covenant enacted upon better promises. Indeed it is. Let us be thankful for it and fully committed to living by its precepts and principles. Let us internalize that law that we might have a better understanding from day to day of how to deal with each other and interact with the world and how to lead people to Christ because, that, because His covenant, His law has become a part of us and a part of the way we think. And let's be grateful for the forgiveness that we have in and through Christ. If you've not yet experienced that forgiveness, it's still available for you. Though Jesus died some 2,000 years ago, roughly, The sacrifice is still good. Remember, once for all time. And so you can still partake of its benefits. If you'll come to Jesus in faith, penitence, willing to confess him, and willing to be immersed in water to contact his saving blood. If you're ready to do that tonight, let us know. Christian, if you need the prayers of your Christian family, For some sin or weakness in your life and you want to bring that before God and before your Christian family, we encourage you to do that tonight as well as we stand and sing.
just very quickly, um, I intended to mention this uh, at the beginning of the sermon, forgot, uh, but wanted to um, uh, mention it tonight too, like we did this morning, and that is to remember, uh, continue to remember uh, Shirley Ferris uh, in our prayers. Um, uh, Kevin may have an update. Uh, we were up there a little this afternoon, but uh, they're still saying just a few days. Uh, she's not responsive this afternoon. Okay, so um, continue to pray for her comfort in her final hours, and of course for Mel and Tom and, and Kevin and the rest of their families. We know this is a difficult time for them. Pray for their strength and, uh, and for their comfort and peace as well. Lord's Supper has been prepared for those who were unable to partake of it this morning. During the singing of this next song, number 80, 80, if you come down to one of the front rows in any of the sections, then uh, you will be served. Number 80. Let's pray. 
Our Father in heaven, we again gather around the table this evening for those that have come, Father, to partake of this memorial supper in remembrance of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Father, we pray now for those that partake of this bread, which represents your Son's body that was given on that tree so long ago, Father. May they reflect on the sacrifice that was made on their behalf, and may they reflect on their own lives, Father, and may they take worthily of this uh, bread, Father. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. And Father in heaven, we thank you so very much for the day you've blessed us with to come before you. So praise and adoration to your name. This time, Father, we pray that you would be with those who are partaking of, of this Lord's Supper in a way that pleases you. We pray, Father, that you'll help them to take their minds back to that moment in time when Christ laid his life down for us and shed his blood uh, for our sins. We pray, Father, that you will bless this cup that represents just that. In Jesus' name, amen. Holy Father, we know that all the things we have in this life come from you, Father. You have so richly and abundantly blessed us, Father, in every way possible. Father, at this time, we take up this collection. We pray that you'll be with those that give. And we pray, Father, for the, the works of this congregation, the things that we participate in to further your kingdom. May these funds uh, go to those works, and may your, those works be a blessing to you in all that we do, Father. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to change the last song. If, um, if you would take out a supplement and turn to number 150, if you would join me in standing for the closing song and the prayer to follow. So 150 in the, in the supplement.
Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to come together in your name. We pray that we have all, we have all been strengthened and encouraged by being here. Strengthen so we can better be able to meet the trials and temptations we will probably encounter this coming week. When we get with friends, neighbors, co-workers, classmates, we may find ourselves in a position where that strength will be challenged. If that happens, we pray that if it ebbs, that you, we, will look, we will look to you for help. We know that if we can endure if we can be faithful, heaven will surely be worth it all. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.